Please stand. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing upon this council. Help and prosper its work for the advancement and benefit of its people, so that peace and happiness, unity and justice may be established among us all. Thank you. Amen. Manningham Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people as the traditional owners of the lands and waterways across the country, now known as Manningham. Council pays respect to elders past, present and emerging and values the ongoing contribution to enrich and appreciate the cultural heritage of Manningham. Council acknowledges and respects Australia's first peoples as traditional owners of lands and waterways across country and encourages reconciliation between all. Manningham Council also values the contribution made to Manningham over the years by people of diverse backgrounds and cultures. Welcome everybody and I welcome members of the public who have joined us tonight in person and also online to observe tonight's proceedings. I would like to advise everybody that tonight's meeting is being audio and video recorded all care will be taken to maintain your privacy. However, as a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded. By remaining in the gallery, it is assumed your consent is given in the event that your voice and or image is broadcast by council. Council's meetings are conducted in accordance with our governance rules. Our rules set out the procedures for how we make our decisions and how the community can participate in our meetings. I will introduce each item of business as listed on the agenda, calling it by number and by reading the title. I will then call for a mover and a seconder of a motion on the item before opening any debate. Only councillors are able to join the debate on an item. Councillors may adopt the officer's recommendation in the report or propose amendments and supplementary motions. I would like to draw your attention to item seven on tonight's agenda, public question time, which provides people with an opportunity to ask questions of the council. Council has allocated 30 minutes for question time at tonight's meeting, and the process for question time is set out in our governance rules. Questions must be received prior to the start of the meeting to be asked, where we receive advance notice of a question in accordance <coughs> with our governance rules we will provide a verbal response to the question at our meeting. Questions we receive today up to 7 p.m. may be taken on notice if we don't have the information on hand to provide a meaningful response. If this happens, you will be provided with a written response to your question within 10 working days from today. I will deal with a maximum of two questions per person and two questions on any one issue. You'll be asked to come forward to the lectern to ask your question where you will have the opportunity to provide a two minute introductory statement before asking your question. If you have more than two questions, please submit these additional questions in writing to council through our normal channels. To ensure the efficient conduct of our meeting and maximum participation during question time, all questions and answers shall be as brief as possible and no discussion is permitted on any question. Councillors and the gallery are reminded that question time is to be conducted in a respectful manner and disorderly conduct will be managed in accordance with our governance rules. Item number two, apologies and requests for leave of absence. There are no apologies. Councillors, are there any requests for leaves of absence? Thank you. Item number three, prior notification of conflict of interest. No prior notifications of conflict of interest have been received. Councillors, would anyone like to give a notice of conflict of interest? Thank you. Item number four, confirmation of minutes. Do I have a mover? Councillor Conlon. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move that the minutes of the council meeting held on 13th of December 2022 be confirmed. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Lang. All those in favour? And that is carried, thank you, unanimously. Item number five, presentations. 
5.1 Australia Day Honours 2023. I'm very pleased to acknowledge and congratulate Manningham residents who have received an award in this year's Australia Day Honours list. And we have five. So we have Miss Anne Inam Barakat for service to the multicultural communities of Victoria. Mr Clifford Burns, Peter Clifford Burns, I'm sorry, Mr Burns, for service to the community and to youth. Mr Gifford Ernest Hatfield, for service to youth through Scouts and to the community. Former Manningham councillor, Miss Dorothy Haynes, for service to the community of Doncaster. And Dr Margaret Ruth Stuckey, for service to community health. Please join me in congratulating these five people, councillor. Item number six, petitions. There are no petitions. Item number seven, public question time. <coughs> so we have received a number of questions for tonight's council meeting, which is great. Anyone submitting a question to council will have the opportunity to read out their question, or you can choose to have your question read out by our CEO. Our first question tonight is from Jenny Marie Carteras. Jenny Marie, would you like to come to the lectern? Hello and welcome. Thank you. You have two minutes to make an introductory statement before asking your questions. Fabulous. Um, I'd like to firstly thank Council for the opportunity to present my question in person. Um, so it's been a month of Pride events and celebrations across Australia, from Adelaide's Better Together Conference, Victoria's Pride Street Party, to Sydney's World Pride and Mardi Gras. The LGBTQIA plus community are valued members of our community who add to our diversity and make Australia a better place to live. Australians are calling for strong leadership where leaders walk the walk. Irrespective of your political persuasion, Anthony Albanese delivered that. He's the first sitting Australian Prime Minister to walk in the Sydney Mardi Gras parade. He signalled to the community that leadership embodies action, not just talk and glossy strategies. Leadership in action is powerful, and increasingly this is what the community expects from their leaders. If the last national and state elections are anything to go by, this message from the community could not be clearer. While it is important that leaders represent diversity in their communities and create an inclusive communi uh, community through their values, policies, strategies and programs, it is also equally important that leaders foster inclusivity and diversity through meaningful symbology whether that be in the workplace or in the community. And examples of this include statues of inspirational Victorian um, Aboriginal women throughout Melbourne, so celebrating their achievements and their contributions, or flying the pride flag, which celebrates pride and inclusion. If we look at the symbology of flying the pride flag, it demonstrates um, leaders are actively taking steps to create a community that is inclusive, it creates a safe space for the LGBTQIA community and it communicates that there is no place for discrimination in the community either. Further, it also signals um, to the community that difference is valued and respected. Daniel Howard, a gay man who grew up in Ulverstone, Tasmania, and for those who know it was one of the most homophobic towns um, in the world actually, and now proudly flies a pride flag at council, said that if there is a pride flag flying proudly in the town centre, then it would change the minds and attitudes of a lot of people. It would help make the region more inclusive by recognising past homophobia and expressing support for the LGBTQIA plus community. I am pleased that Manningham Council is demonstrating its commitment to being inclusive and celebrating the diversity within council through its strategies, initiatives and attendance at pride events. There is a real opportunity for council to create an inclusive community through important symbology such as raising the pride flag. In doing this, it will signal to our LGBTQIA plus residents that they are valued members of our community, that they can feel safe in the, um, in the community or at council. And also it demonstrates that leaders of Manningham walk the walk, 
not just talk about equality and inclusion. Thank my you, Jenny question, Murray. And are you going to leave with your yeah, question now? Yeah, my question. Thank yeah, you. my question is: Will Council consider permanently displaying the Pride flag amongst the Australian flag, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag? Thank you. And I'm going to ask Lee Robson, the Director of Connected Communities, to respond. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, Jenny Marie, for your question. Manningham Council continues its commitment to being inclusive and to celebrate diversity by having attendance at the Midsummer Pride March. We certainly marched this year and have marched in previous years, recognising Ida Hobbit Day, which is the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Lesbophobia and Transphobia, and working closely with Council's Gender Equality and LGBTIQA Plus Advisory Committee. With regards to flying a flag, the Australian National Flag Protocols stipulate that only official flags of nations recognised by Australia should be flown in conjunction with the Australian national flag. Council recognises the significance of certain flags and use, utilises the five designated flag poles within the civic precinct to permanently fly the following officially proclaimed flags, the Australian national flag, the Victorian state flag, the Aboriginal flag, the Torres Strait Islander flag and Manningham Council flag. Under Manningham Council's flying flags in the civic precinct policy, the Manningham Council flag may be removed to accommodate an endorsed celebration or event and replaced with the relevant flag for the specified event or time frame for a maximum of seven days. So under the current policy, the community flags that are flown uh, as part of our annual schedule include International Women's Day on the 8th of March, Ida Hobbit Day on the 17th of May and United Nations Day on the 24th of October. That's our position on flags at the moment. Thanks, Jenny Marie. Thank you, Lee. Our next question is from Warren Burns. Warren, would you like to come to the lectern? Thank you, and it's good to see you, Warren. Hi. You have two minutes to make an introductory statement before asking your question. Cool. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me along this evening. My recent experience with the planning department was difficult. Uh, poor communication of progress, unclear requirements, protracted gaps in activity. Um, however, it was difficult to work out where the issue really was. Without exception, every other party in the process CFA, arborists, uh, other consultants, planning consultants, etc., always blamed the council. Because it was so difficult to engage anyone at the council, it meant that the other parties had free reign to blame the council on every delay that happened throughout the process. Now, I'm sure that the council wasn't responsible for all of them, but it didn't matter. The council got the blame for all of them. Um, the planning process certainly has areas that need improvement, Months were lost to errors. Tens and tens of thousands of dollars of extra expenses were incurred during this process as a result of those errors. The question tonight is to prompt a conversation about how visibility of how this process is supposed to work is the first step towards countering the negativity that the other parties involved in the planning process are able to inflict upon the planning department for things that are out of their control. Published service levels, realistic expectation setting and better visibility of the progress of the process as it's executed would stop other parties from using the council as an excuse for delays, even when the reasons behind the delays in the process are not the council's. Here's my two questions. Question one, would the council consider publishing its current and future performance against service levels relating to council response times associated with planning permits? In the knowledge that it's a broad church, so there would need to be some guidance around that. Question number two, would the council undertake a review of the existing processes related to the provision of building and planning permits to ensure that reasonable service levels are communicated to the applicant in advance and that those service levels remain measured and visible to all parties throughout the application process? That's the question. 
Thank you, Warren. I'm going to ask the Director of City Planning, Duncan Turner, to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Byrne, for your question and the thoughts that sit, sit behind the questions. Um, for clarity, Council do not issue building permits. We issue planning permits, and I understand that's the basis for your question. Um, Council issue planning permits in accordance with the processes uh, defined by the state government laws. Timelines for planning decisions are influenced by numerous variables, including the quality and level of information lodged by applicants, the complexity of planning considerations, public consultation, external agency referrals and appeal processes. Um, state planning performance data is reported to the community in the Manningham quarterly report. In addition, planning activity data is published on state government reporting platforms, including Planning Permit Activity Reporting System, PPARS, and the Local Government Reporting frame Framework. The platforms provide an ability to comp compare individual councils' performances against uh, across Victoria. Based on the benchmark set by the state government, Manningham is, a high, is high performing relative to other metropolitan and Victorian councils. Uh, in reference to your second question, um, Council embraces continuous improvement and a commitment in improving user experiences across all its services. This is facilitated through an embedded service management framework to assess plan service planning and performance on all Council services. Council takes particular interest in the performance um, or our performance for the management of statutory planning applications and performance indicators are included in the Manningham quarterly report, which is being tabled tonight um, for the last quarter. Uh, our performance across a range of services is included in our annual report, which is available on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan, and thank you, Warren. Our next question is from Morris Waters. Morris, are you in the gallery this evening? I think he's watching online, so I will ask the CEO to read out your question, Morris. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, on behalf of Mr Waters, why does the council not have a dedicated complaints department? All similar size large bodies and some councils have them. At present, any complaint made is sent back to the same person, most likely responsible for the complaint. As such, complaints cannot be handled independently. Are senior council officers, CEO, etc., aware of complaints? Thank you, Andrew. I'll ask the Director of Experience and Capability, Karen Patterson, to respond. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Waters, for your question tonight. Manningham Council is committed to a fair and consistent process for managing our complaints. Our process is outlined in our Manningham Complaints Policy, which is available to the public via our website. The policy has been developed with reference to the Local Government Act and also a range of best practice guides, such as those from the Victorian Ombudsman. The policy provides a tiered framework for handling complaints and it includes a process for internal independent review by a senior member of council, which can include a director and the CEO. There is also an option for an external review via the Victorian Ombudsman. In addition, there is monthly reporting of customer data to senior officers to ensure transparency and timely action in handling requests and complaints. We encourage feedback and value as a valuable opportunity to review our policies, procedures and practices and make changes where necessary and we'll continuously review our complaints policies and processes based on your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'll ask the CEO to read out the second question for Mr Waters. Thank you, Mayor. The second question is on rates notices um, and Mr Waters states, we were charged interest since remitted um, as we did not receive in mail two instalment notices. Rates officers advised these two notices were issued by BPayView. There is no such thing. Officers also advised there is a 10 day notice sent by email requiring a very complex online form to be completed. I am an older person, 82, with limited computer skills and a poor memory. 
I'm unable to do this, surely council would encourage email rate notices, not discourage them. Thank you, Andrew. Can I please ask our Chief Financial Officer, John Gorst, to provide a response? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr Waters, for the question. Uh, Mr Waters, a member of our rates team has uh, called Mr Waters today and left a message for Mr Waters to call them back so that they can walk Mr Waters through how he can set himself up to receive rate notices via email in the future. Excellent. Thank you for that response, John. So moving to our next question, um, we have Two similar questions from the Doncaster Athletics Club. So I would ask Daryl Kilmartin and Nathan Down to come to the lectern together. Thank you both and thank you for coming along tonight. Um, so I will start with Nathan. Yep. Yes. So, Nathan, if you could please have two minutes to make your introductory statement and then lead with your questions, and then we might move to Daryl to do the same. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for having me this evening. So, my name's Nathan Down. Uh, I'm the president of the Doncaster Athletic Club, who I represent uh, the current member base. So, I'm here to talk in specific relation to the Thursday evening allocation time slot from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Understanding I only have a brief few minutes, I'll outline my involvement from September last year, an outline that due process has simply not been followed and which has brought us here this evening. I'd like to start by outlining that Doncaster Athletic Club has been involved in this municipality for over 52 years and utilised the Tom Kelly Athletics track and is the past tenor, tenure of this specific time slot for the last two years. We have a number of training groups uh, we cater for, um, including our recreational running club, the Ruffy Runners. I was originally contacted by David Price in September last year, outlining that Westerfoldians, another recreational running squad, had requested to move from Wednesday to Thursday evening. Uh, sorry, one second. Thursday evening time slot, and they would be doing this, um, and if we are okay to share. There's a number of reasons why sharing in this case is not feasible, which Dara will touch on in a moment. At that point, I asked how they would simply move from Wednesday to Thursday and take that time allocation when we were the incumbent club. The allocation process and points were retrospectively brought to my attention, where we were allocated four points and Westerfoldians five points. We obviously challenged the scoring of points where we felt they were incorrectly allocated. We obviously challenged the sport, um, we were then given another point for no pass discretion, and it was then tied with five points each. It was then up to the clubs to work out how they would share the facility going forward. This is not looking after the incumbent, which Robert Morton directly told me, the allocation process is set up to protect and support the incumbent. There are two points. There's the first point on tenure, past tenure. Westerfoldians had it for two years, Ruffy Runners and, and the DAC club had it for two years and we simply did not get the point. The second point was inclusiveness. And this is the point that's upset us the most. We're not, we're not standing here and saying that Westerfoldians are not inclusive, but we definitely are inclusive and we, are, to this day, have not been given proper um, feedback on why we are not being allocated the point for inclusiveness. There was clearly a preconceived outcome with this respect to this allocation and the points have not been alloca allocated fairly, which has sw swayed the ultimate outcome. Which brings me to my question. Do the councillors of Manningham believe that where a decision is made by a council officer that greatly impacts the club in question and where as a club we feel an error in the application of the council um, application has been made and where we formally challenge the decision that the desire to support the council officer by their superiors should take precedence over the exercise of due process of the allocation criteria? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. And I will invite Daryl to... Um have his two minutes to provide some background and then ask his question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The, uh, on the 15th of December 2020, this council adopted the Sporting Al Facilities Allocations Policy. The purpose of this policy, and I quote, is to create a transparent, equitable and su sustainable framework to maximise use of the council sporting facilities, whilst ensuring compliance against risk and insurance obligations. 
Uh, we, as a long-term community sporting club and the longest tenant of the Tom Kelly Athletic Track, were given the opportunity to provide feedback to the draft of this policy, and we actually believe it's a good policy. We support the policy. We have no problem with the policy whatsoever. We do, however, have problem with the application of the policy in our case. Uh, the policy does, however, have a significant emphasis on maximising use. And while we agree that council assets should benefit as many as possible, the allocation criteria provides a guide to overcoming conflict, conflicting allocation requests. Council, uh, and again I quote, will aim to sustainably maximise usage of sports fields and pavilions, which includes considering shared use by multiple user groups where it is deemed appropriate. And this is where we differ. The council officers deem it appropriate for us to share the facility between 7.30 and 9 o'clock on a Thursday night. We categorically do not. We have stated this over and over, and I can state for you now the, the reasons for that are very much about the inclusivity. It's about uh, women who have been in their homes gaining weight and not feeling good about themselves, venturing for the first time into a public arena to do sporting, uh, something physically to help themselves. People that we've attracted to through programs the Council have put forward, such as This Girl Can, that we've been involved in for the last couple of years and promoting that activity. We get these people come down and they have to share the track with a group of unaligned people who do not facilitate the, the vision and the agenda of what we're trying to achieve with these people. And uh, we, we take this very seriously. It's not just young people, it's people from different cultures who are not used to mingling uh, with our community that we also include in our group. We have all of these conflicting uh, reasons why we do not wish to share the facility. So having come to the point of sharing five points apiece and being told we must share, well, we say, well, well, show us how the points are allocated. And we go, what on earth? How can you tell us we're not inclusive? And because Westerfoldian's inclusive running group have the word inclusive in their name, do they get the point because they put it in their name? Thank you, Daryl. Can you the ask question, your question? Sorry, Mayor. The question, will the councillors here present intervene on behalf of the Doncaster Athletic Club to ensure that the seasonal allocations policy established by this council to ensure due process and transparent outcomes is correctly applied and overturn the unjustifiable and untenable determination that Doncaster Athletic Club be required to share the Thursday night 7.30 to 9 o'clock allocation at Tom Kelly Athletic Track with a rival municipality's recreational running group. Thank you, Dal and Nathan. I am going to ask the councillor for Waldau Ward, councillor Anna Chen, to provide a response. You can do it for me. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Nathan, for your questions. My fellow councillors and I do appreciate the work and dedication of the Doncaster Athletics Club. That dedication is evident tonight. I know that you have met with council officers for several occasions about this matter. I also know that the allocation that you refer to was reviewed by several senior officers against our allocation policy, which I also have a copy. And I reviewed it from time to time myself. I understand that you disagree with the determination made by officers in how the policies was applied in this instance. I can understand that this is frustrating to you, uh, for you. It is also acknowledged that officers have tried to negotiate a shared outcome to maximize the availability of the athletic track to the widest possible range of user groups. In terms of a way forward, councillors had called for a review. I repeat, councillors have called for a review of the grants allocation policy this year. The policy review will help clarify the process so that it is clear to all involved what criteria is being applied and why to allocate our facilities. I would also like to invite both of you to meet with me 
and the mayor and officers to work through the criteria and to understand how it has been applied. I will ask the mayor's office to reach out to arrange a convenient time. Again, I hear you and I would really thank you for both of you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Our next question is from Mark Vincent. Mark, would you like to make your way to the lectern? I don't know that Mark is here, so I will ask the CEO to read out Mark, Mr Vincent's questions. So we can. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first question is, what is the status of the illegal parking reports known to date that have been submitted to Council relating to a non-resident parking in a resident-only location in Marnie Street? This includes an infringement relating to parking on the nature strip only on the day of the signs being updated by Council. I'll ask a second question as well. Yeah. Um, when is Council going to take action on parking restrictions in place at Marnie Street, Lower Templestowe? Thank you, Andrew. Can I ask the Director of City Planning, Duncan Turner, to provide a response to both questions? Thank you, Mr Vincent, uh, for your question. Uh, action taken in response to parking breaches is dependent on a number of factors, including risk, impact on safety and damage to property. Officers take a measured approach when enforcing parking restrictions across the municipality. I can confirm that um, your notifications have been received by council officers. Multiple visits to Mahani Street have occurred in direct response to your concerns and appropriate enforcement action taken. And uh, again, I can confirm for you, Mr Vincent, that the matter remains open and that officers will continue to, to patrol the area. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Our next question is from Alison Ray. Alison, would you like to come to the lectern? Thank you. Thank you. And you have, like the others, two minutes to make an introductory statement before asking your question. Yep, thank you, and thank you for listening to me this evening. Um, my question relates to Tyndall's Wildflower Reserve and the um, preservation of that area. Um, I first went to Tyndall's Wildflower Reserve three years ago and was amazed and delighted by what I found there. I started to document with my camera um, the fragile and varied plant life and birds that I saw there. As the seasons passed, I went back many times and each time discovered more and developed a great appreciation uh, for uh, what a treasure we have. Uh, and it should be said that there are also other areas of Manningham that are likewise you know, of enormous value. Uh, I want to give this book um, to all of you, the councillors, to show you the beauty and the richness of the indigenous plant and flowers that we are so lucky to have in our local bushland. And um, of course, you may already be aware of this, but with this book, the council has a visual record of our indigenous plant heritage and what we stand to lose if it's not well protected. Uh, I've been involved as a volunteer in the Deer Impact on Vegetation Surveys in Manningham, and I'm very well aware of the extent of destruction that deer can cause in a very short time. This growing impact of deer is of great concern to me and also to many others. With these photographs in the book that I've given all of you, I want to win your hearts and uh, your minds so that when you're considering protecting an area such as uh, Tyndall's Wildflower Reserve, you have not only reports and statistics and financial balance sheets, 
but also some very clear images of the rare beauty that can so quickly be lost. Such a beautiful and fragile environment deserves our care in order to thrive and be passed on to future generations. I hope that you agree that this is worthy of council attention. Uh, the fence around Tyndall's Wildflower Reserve is inadequate at the moment and is not in good repair, and hence my question uh, for you. Uh, so the question is, is Manningham Council concerned about the potential for deer invasion and damage within Tyndall's Wildflower Reserve, given that the boundary fence is old and built to a low height? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alison Ray, for your question. It was nice to meet you before as well. Tyndall's Wildflower Reserve is a, best, a very special place that is known to us and something that we um, do want to preserve as well for future generations within Manningham. As, uh, thank you also for participating in the recent survey that actually helped inform a recent contract um, for protection of um, the biodiversity areas within Manningham. And just talking to you a bit about this program, as part of a statewide deer control program, the state government last year granted 100,000 to Manningham to protect Manningham's biodiversity values through strategic deer control. So the inputs from the survey that um, you had input into actually helped formulate what that would, what would look like. Um, what the program is aiming to do is actually preserve some of these known areas within Manningham. We've just engaged a contractor who's been hired to manage and improve Council's deer control program, which is a targeted program and actually delivers on the state government's period urban deer control grant that was granted to us last year. Over 2022 to 2023 financial year, the contractor will be working across the week to raise awareness amongst our residents of the impact of feral deer on biodiversity and coordinate and expand the deer control program across Manningham. The program involves monitoring feral deer and their impact on the environment and targeting eligible private properties in the Green Wedge to consider deer management, as well as our own program that we run as well. We were not aware of the known issues with deer in relation to Tyndall's Reserve. However, thank you for your feedback and information, and we will ensure that that fence height is raised so that we can protect that area. And I look forward to reading your book as well. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you again, Alison, and for, for the photo book. Our next question is from Rick Fallon. I hope I've pronounced your surname correctly. Fallon. Fallon. Um, could you come to the lectern, please? So you have two minutes again to introduce, make an introductory statement, and then read your question. Thank you. I'm just keen on finding out more on the 20 Minute Neighbourhoods initiative that will slowly be rolling out. Will every council simply be called a smart city or will all local councils have multiple 20 Minute Neighbourhoods within their boundaries? Thank you. I'm going to ask the CEO to respond to your question. Thanks for travelling to be here, Rick. Um, I mean, obviously I can't comment on the other 78 municipalities in terms of how they go about effectively what you're talking about is, is strategic planning and strategic planning frameworks for their um, municipalities. But every council does do it. Um, Manningham City Council have done it um, with the objective, obviously, of setting out a plan for the next 20 years. So Manningham Council back in July adopted its livable city um, strategy 2040, uh, basically setting out a blueprint to make sure that Manningham remains um, one of, if not the most livable place in Melbourne, but recognising that, you know, we need to do that in a planned way and ensure that people have got accessibility to, to good shops, um, housing, um, 
education, all of those sorts of things, as well as a city that is, is laid out um, with the right sort of amenity uh, to which the community become accustomed to and future thinking as well in terms of what community expectation would be. So I can't comment on, on what every other council is doing and the names that they use, but that's the, uh, that's the key guiding document here at Manningham. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Rick, for your question. So that was a great question time. Thank you, everybody. I'm now going to move to item number eight, which is admission of urgent business. And there are no items of urgent business. Item number nine, planning permit applications. There are no planning permit applications requiring a decision of the council this evening. Item number 10, city planning. And there are no city planning reports. Item number 11, connected communities. 11.1, Manningham Reconciliation Action Plan 2023 to 2025. Do I have a mover? Councillor Laura Main. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Laura Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. After a long process and lots of consultation, we are finally looking to adopt our reconcil Reconciliation Action Plan, or RAP, as we like to say. The RAP intends to convey our commitment to inclusive into inclusivity in our First Nations people and extend our acknowledgement that we in Manningham all live, work and play on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land. This plan aims to develop meaningful relationships with our First Nation people, foster respect and understanding, value and protect cultural heritage and support First Nation groups in public spaces. Since 1997, Council has been demonstrating our commitment to reconciliation and we have been on a journey since. We established our, rap, our first RAP in 2012 and then again in 2015, and have since had a review in 2018, which led us to where we are today. The review identified some of the barriers, um, that being level of integrated commitment and limitations to monitoring and resourcing. As a result, Council has established a whole Council approach to reconciliation, as we attempt to consider this in everything that we do. Notably, we have completed consultation with our RAP working group and our Warage Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation, all in accordance with guidance from Reconciliation Australia. Council noted our draft RAP last year in June, and since the RAP has gone through further consultation, including your say survey responses, drop-in sessions at all our neighbourhood houses, consultation with advisory committees, and more. So I'd like to thank the officers for their work and the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Council for their collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Nothing further to add, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Do I have any speakers against? Do I have any other speakers for? Councillor Conlon. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. I, I, yes, I'd just like to thank the Wurundjeri um, consultation team of elders that, uh, that have endorsed this plan. Uh, it's, it has been a long process and um, I appreciate the, uh, the patience that, that our officers have had and the Wurundjeri elders have had in terms of um, coming to an agreement on this. And it's great to, to hear the Wurundjeri elders endorse this plan, otherwise it wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on. So um, I really, I think this is something we as a council can be proud of and uh, I really would like to thank the officers again for their patience and it's a long, long journey of reconciliation but um, these, these tiny steps are all part of that, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Conlon, and well said. Any other speakers? I will put that motion to a vote. All those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. I'd like to move on to item number 11.2, pricing policy for the use of council active open space. Do I have a mover? So moved, Madam Thank Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. And is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, this uh, item of business is uh, sending out our draft um, pricing policy for sporting fields. 
um, for official community consultation. Uh, the officers went out with a unendorsed draft a year ago and has had some quite comprehensive uh, consultation with sporting clubs to the point where we are now ready to go out and seek council endorsement of the official draft. Um, there were some tweaks that flowed from that consultation uh, process. Um, we've settled on remaining a flat peppercorn lease for our tennis clubs, bowls clubs and um, pony fields, whereas the initial draft talked about a per court or a per green fee. So we've gone back to you know just if you've got 10 courts or you've got four courts, it's the single peppercorn fee. And on those lease arrangements, um, the idea is that the clubs have to pay for the maintenance and so effectively they get, they get a peppercorn lease. Uh, there is some commentary in there about um, commercial tennis coaches. There was a look, uh, initially an exploration of uh, commercial levy for commercial tennis coaches, uh, but in the end the report decided to uh, look to deal with that issue through the lease renewals of the tennis clubs going forward. Um, probably the biggest change in this policy is um, moving to more cost recovery for turf cricket, um, which if you're honest, is our most expensive endeavour in terms of uh, maintaining and preparing uh, turf cricket pitches. So um, in addition to a team fee, for instance, which we're requiring um, all the sporting clubs to pay, uh, there will also be a 50% cost recovery from those utilising our turf cricket clubs, which will be quite an appreciable increase. And so the draft policy proposes that this will be staggered over three years. Um, I have to admit, I'm personally a little bit challenged by um, the proposed increases on the turf cricket, and, and I think it will be interesting to see the official feedback, and I do leave open the possibility of some, some tweaks. There are a lot of cost of living pressures uh, out there at the moment, and Council, you know, I think do, does need to look at affordability as much as possible. Um, the footy clubs make fortunes selling alcohol and, and uh, entry fees. The cricket clubs don't have anyone watching and, and have a lot less revenue. So they struggle to raise as much money as the footy clubs who literally in Manningham pay hundreds of players. Um, there's some interesting debates in the policy, like the cricket clubs were saying, well, what about the damage the footy clubs do to the ovals? And uh, can we have a discount because of that? And the officers considered that and decided to not... Um, run with that uh, that argument. Um, and uh, I should say we've had our first uh, meeting of our new RASAC committee, the Recreation and Sport Advisory Committee, a couple of weeks ago, and we'll be having a special Zoom meeting with them on uh, March the 8th uh, to get their official or to get some uh, feedback on this policy, because having set up an advisory committee and then straight into a draft pricing policy, it's very good to get their 16 expert members to provide us with um, official feedback. So it's very comprehensive. Um, I think it will trigger quite a debate because there is overall an increase in revenue for council, which is always a sensitive issue when dealing with volunteer managed uh, sporting clubs. But uh, the officers have done a very thorough job. There's been a lot of consultation. I think the arguments are well reasoned. I think it, uh, it may well just come down to a straight decision about the level of subsidy that the council is prepared to pay and the level of user pays principle that we wish to move into. There's a figure of 35% cost recovery in there uh, with a, a cost of over 900,000 and cost recovery of 300. And then there's some concessions that which get the cost recovery figure down to 21%, which, which some people will argue is, is, is reasonable. So I'm looking forward to an interesting debate. I encourage everyone to, to provide um, some feedback and I'd like to thank the officers for a very comprehensive pro uh, process of consultation engagement, research, and uh, well-argued uh, uh, pricing proposals. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Councillor Conlon, would you like to speak to the motion? Yeah, just briefly, Mayor. Um, I'd just uh, like to just reinforce uh, Councillor Main's uh, statement that you know, this is going out to, to the public and the sporting clubs for consultation. This is not a final decision. And um, we, you know, I would encourage everyone who's interested to have their say. Uh, and I really appreciate the work that the, um, our, as Councillor May mentioned, the, the Recreation and Sports Advisory Committee have um, kicked off and um, uh, yeah, really, really appreciate their, um, their input into this. So I'm looking forward to hosting that meeting to consider that. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Do I have any speakers against? Do I have any further speakers for? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? Thank you, councillors. That is carried unanimously. So I will move to item 11.3, the Wonga Park Reserve Master Plan. Do I have a mover? That the recommendation be adopted, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. And is there a seconder? Councillor Kleinert, thank you. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm actually pleased to be able to speak to the Wonga Park Reserve concept idea this evening. This is an exciting item and something that councillors and officers should be very proud of. As you know, Wonga Park Reserve is a unique area and as the report states, it's one of a kind flat space in this corner of our municipality. The improvements set out in the concept idea are much needed and highly anticipated by the community, where recreation and sport facilities are pivotal to enriching community life and the only hub for local and surrounding residents. With all our many Manningham Reserve concept ideas, we need to focus on what is necessary, not what is just nice to have. The Wonga Park Reserve concept idea provides high, medium and low actions founded on necessary priorities of functionality, safety, accessibility, inclusivity for all Manningham residents. As councillors, we advocate for our marginal recreation activities too for our residents' health and wellbeing. This is the only space in the area where you can do walking, running or cycling. And therefore, the um, concept idea focus on improvements to the path network, exercise equipment, the bike jumps, and the redesign of the picnic area for those recreational activities. We should be very proud of the detailed consultation that went into this concept idea. There was targeted consultation with our sporting clubs and active sessions with our surrounding community. The community feedback and the audit data gave a few recommendations to upgrade both of the turf fields for compliance the netboard courts, floodlights for safety, upgrade of the tennis courts and conversion of the floodlights to LED for sustainability, to construct a small amenity facility adjacent to the netboard courts so that participants can use the <coughs> toilets, spaces to change, storage and shelter, as well as a public toilet for all community use, to improve connectivity for with new paths and upgrading the existing park network for those recreational activities and the provision of um, the existing bike drunk jumps to make them more safe. Like all high, medium and low action actions following endorsement tonight, councillors, they will be delivered based on our priority ranking for our whole municipal wide programs. But I am pleased to advise that two projects are already currently in our capital works program the netball floodlights and court upgrade, as well as the Western Oval development. The netball um, floodlight um, upgrade is identified as a high priority through our recreational capital works program for compliance, safety, drainage and gender equality. At Manningham, we actively support female participation in sport and we recognise the need to back this up with improvements to our facilities to make them safe and attractive for young women to use. I am thrilled to advise that the early design for the netball upgrade improvements will be soon underway and therefore future work will include the amenities block so the players don't have to trek in the dark and can be safe while doing so. The Western Oval um, upgrade is also prioritised due to its, sport con its poor condition. It not only affects the training and program for cricket and, and soccer, it also affects game day and other use of the oval. I want to assure the clubs that the works will be comprehensive and they will include addressing the subsurface drainage to really tackle the underlying problem. I want to thank the combined sports clubs of Wonga Park. They are the mainstay of our community. Netball, soccer and cricket, 
They've all been enthusiastic participants and I want to personally thank them for their participation, trust in me and the Manningham officers and their patience while we follow due process. Councillors, I also want to acknowledge our support from local parliament members, Mr Ryan Smith MP and Mr Keith Wallahan, who have maintained a key interest in this program. The Wonga Park Reserve concept idea is about maximum safe community use. And I would like to congratulate Manningham officers and community advocates for dedication, patience and partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Kleinert, would you like to speak to the motion? It has been very well summarised. Thank you. Do I have any speakers against? Any other speakers for? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item number 11.4, the Manningham Youth Advisory Committee. Do I have a mover? Councillor Chen. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, councillor. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, councillor Lightbody. Councillor Chen, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, 2022 was a successful year for the newly established Manningham Youth Advisory Committee. The committee provided feedback on council policies and plans, such as Climate Emergency Action Plan, helped develop council's youth mental health advocacy campaign, and raised awareness and advocated also for a local headspace. Principal's Breakfast was a significant initiative delivered by the committee and council to discuss the emerging issues affecting young people. The committee's key achievements are outlined in the annual report in Attachment 1. Council endorsed an advisory committee terms of reference template in 2022 after the committee's original terms of reference was adopted. <coughs> Therefore, we also need to review the committee's terms of reference to ensure consistency with the other advisory committee's terms of reference and reflect the target members of young people aged 16 to 25. The original terms of reference provide for one year committee membership with the option to extend for a further year. In order to avoid the need for an annual call of expressions of interest. It is proposed that a rolling committee membership pool be developed for a two-year period. Council endorsed nominees will be allocated either the first or second year of committee membership to provide seamless transition, continuity in committee's knowledge, and ensure an ongoing quorum. The amended terms of reference is in attachment three. The committee's current term will conclude in December 2023, and expressions of interest will be sought in the latter half of the year for the next committee term commencing in 2024. Currently, the committee has four vacancies that has been filled from the pool of previous expression of interest process for the remainder of the committee's term in 2023. <coughs> Under the terms of reference, these appointments are approved by the CEO on the delegation, and council will be advised accordingly. The 2023 committee has 15 members, including two representatives from Manningham Youth Services. The four members are Kalala McNight, Iman Salim, Christopher Seal Pelicus, and Lily Agawai. These members represent the youth voice in council's policies and plans, as one of the three councillor representatives and co chair of the committee. I look forward to working with the members and supporting the members to contribute their skills and knowledge and develop new skills as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Councillor Lai, would you like to speak to the motion? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think this was a really interesting read, the annual report from the Youth Advisory Committee. And while I have not actually been able to attend the committee session so far, I do look forward to the opportunity to attend events in the future. And I have met a number of the committee members at our other events, including our annual Civic Awards Night this year. So I'd like to congratulate the people who were nominated for that, who also help out on this advisory committee that we have. Um, I think it's really good, and I think the report highlights how well it's done in terms of engagement with the youth on the committee, in terms of how satisfied they are with different outcomes that they set out to achieve, including input on our strategic policies and visions, as well as getting a greater understanding of how council works and how the roles of particularly like the CEO's office and the mayor's office run. Um, but I think I'll leave it at there, that and let someone else have a speak to the motion as well. Thank you, Councillor Lightbody. Before we do that, I'll ask if I have any speakers against the motion. Do we have any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Laura Main. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the co-chair of the Manningham Youth Advisory Committee in 2022, I'd like to say its first year in operation was a great success. We brought together a diverse, capable and engaged group of young people and discussed a variety of issues, not only educating this group um, on some of the council's operations, but also, also gathering a lot of their great input. Along with, some of, along with the areas discussed and some of the new initiatives that Councillor Chen detailed, members of the committee also got the chance to develop their governance skills, which you wouldn't often get at that age, um, such as rotating chair position and minute takers appointed at each meeting. Overall, the advisory committee had great reviews, which can be noted in its annual report, and I'm looking forward to welcoming the new, the new four members, Councillor Chen as a new member of the committee, and oh, Councillor Goff as a new member of the committee, and Councillor Chen as a new co-chair of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Loramain. Do I have any other speakers for? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that is unanimously carried. Thank you, Councillors. Item number 12, City Services. 12.1, Mid-Year Capital Works Update. Do I have a mover? Yeah, I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. And uh, do I have a seconder? I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, uh, every time this year we, we have two sort of half-time reports, the, the quarterly financial and operating report, which picks up the first six months of the financial year and the mid-year capital works update. It does cover some um, similar territory, but the, the high level um, detail in the mid-year capital works update is that um, we've so far spent 16 million of the budgeted 64.5 million, so we've spent around 25%. Uh, that, that reflects normal local government seasonality where the biggest spend tends to be uh, in the June quarter. Uh, we are expecting to spend 55 million of the 64.5 million, so we, we, we will make up some ground. I think the the explanation for the underspend is is reasonably clear cut to understand. It's a tough market to source uh, contractors with all these big projects uh, around us competing. Uh, there's labour shortages. Um, uh, there's a lim limited pool of available contractors, and the lead times can be quite long, and the significant delays in consultancy work and external approvals. Um, so um, when we got elected. Uh, councillors, I think we had a run rate of 45 million a year on capital. Um, we increased that in our first uh, four-year plan, sort of strategic budget, to 55 million a year. And there is an important accounting change uh, uh, flagged in this um, three-page report tonight. So I draw councillors' attention to 3.8, and I'll read that out. It's intended that future iterations of the Capital Works Program include a budget for infrastructure maintenance. This will increase the overall budget that we report on by about 20 million a year. So that figure of 550 million over 10 years is from now on going to be 748 million. So there's, a, there's an accounting change where the infrastructure maintenance is going to be included in the capital works budget. So we will see from now on um, an uplift in the reported uh, capital works uh, budget. In terms of major projects, um, uh, we've got uh, people will know about Jumping Creek Road, 
Uh, in terms of looking forward, there's this examining issues like a library at the Pines, Aquarina outdoor pool, improved netball facilities. We have stepped up spending in, in core areas like drainage um, and footpaths, and we're, we're battling with some issues such as a $4 million spend redoing the cladding on, um, on MC squared. But uh, overall, um, our balance sheet, we've still got uh, 2.5 billion in assets. Um, we've got that regular cash flow of 150 million plus coming in. So we've got uh, a good position to step up the capital work spend in the years ahead. Um, and I thank the officers for preparing this mid-year report. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say the other um, reason for the shortages um, in the lead times for our capital works. There's also the issue of um, securing uh, materials for capital works projects, and that is in the private and the public sector um, councillors. So it is a very difficult climate to be um, constructing in. And I just want to thank the officers for having projects which are shovel ready and being able to, um, and what I mean by that is planned and prepared to be able to fast track when um, we can't do certain works and we need to um, move on to another one and we've got one ready. So I think that is wise planning. I think that is something we should be proud of. And it does mean that in a 10 year forecast, we are progressing well. So thank you to officers. Thank you, Councillor Carly Lang. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for? Councillor Conlon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to point out um, that this also, the, the report notes a draft 10 year program that will be, capital works program that will be circulated publicly for comment prior to being approved by a council in June 2023. And that will cover that $750 million that Councillor Main mentioned that we will be spending over the next 10 years. And uh, I think it's uh, also like to congratulate the officers for having the foresight to, um, to prepare that program and also to resource uh, our um, resource that planning side of it so that we can have projects ready to go rather than just a, a magical number there that we actually don't really know how much it's going to cost or when it's going to happen. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers for? I will put that motion to a vote. All those in favour? Thank you. That is carried unanimously. Item 13, experience and capability. So 13.1 Manningham quarterly report quarter to October to December 2022 to 23. Do I have a mover? Madam Mayor, I move as on the paper. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Is there a seconder? Second that, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Councillor Goff, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, very much, uh, Councillor Main was absolutely correct because it does cover quite a bit of the uh, stuff that we've gone over already within the budget. Uh, but uh, I, wa I want to start on uh, just discussing one thing and, and and uh, if councillors that were here in the last council can remember uh, the changes that were made uh, in preparing our capital works budget to enable us to actually have substitutes or other things to come in, uh, knowing full well we needed lead time to get A, grants, and B, uh, this, and it's going to have needed to be done this time. And we can see in the report here that we've got items that are ready to bring forward. Uh, because of that, because of the, what we try to do in a budget is an impossible thing. And that is fit building programs into a financial year. And it is just absolutely impossible to do so. Because anything can go wrong as soon as you go out there and start building. You don't know what's underground. There are a whole lot of things. There are so many variables. And to juggle and try to fit that in all the time is an impossibility. So we need to be flexible and need to be flexible in our reporting of how we, how we report that and how we report success. But I think the major thing is that it's been uh, identified early on. So we have six months to actually redress some of that situation and do what we said to the community and spend that capital works money on capital works items 
uh, bringing forward some things that are ready to go into the next year. And it's that strategic planning ahead of time uh, that has allowed us to be flexible to do this. And no, we may not achieve the 100% uh, expenditure uh, in this particular year, but again, like last year, it will be carried on. And unfortunately, when it comes up to looking at success in some things, it has to be done in that financial year and spent in that financial year. But in reality, if we're on top of that and abreast of that, we're covering it. I like the explanations we've got there. I like the solutions that are proposed with regard to the, the capital works programs that are going on in there. Uh, it is a difficult time. The variances, and I think on the financial states that we look, uh, the explanations for the variances were, uh, were quite clear. Uh, we have had some uh, favourable employee costs, whether it's a positive or a negative, it means that we haven't got the people here working. Uh, that's a negative, the positive side of it. We've got some extra money and it's interesting to see that the interest we're earning is starting to climb up and I should imagine that that would, over a period of time, continue to climb up uh, for us with regard to that. Look, we are in an excellent financial status. Uh, the money is invested and, as it's there, invested in secure investments uh, really across the board. We've got um, situations where we uh, basically uh, go through and, and it's interesting to read through all of the council plan actions. They don't necessarily have a dollar figure against them, but they do have a lot of work behind them. So when you sort of say, oh, we've, we've just done a, a plan for this for the, for the council, there's a lot of work and community consultation that goes in it, but it's worth noting uh, a lot of the things that we have done. Uh, and, and I do know that a whole lot of angst goes down to spending very little money, but you know, always the when I look at the community grants policy, there's a lot of time uh, for a little bit of money. But we do spend, and I'm, I'm just looking at some of the things here, and, I'm, and for Councillor Lang, I'm sick of hearing about Melbourne Hill Road. It's ready again here on the top of this page. It just keeps on coming up. But look, we are spending money in the areas that we need to spend money in and works are going on. And that's with the drainage strategy and all of those uh, drainage and road upgrades. Uh, we've got work being done on the uh, uh, Tuckers Road and a Jumping Creek Road design is getting complete there. They're major expenditures by council. You know, Jumping Creek Road is in the 20, 30 million, seven, 17 or it's going up it, million dollars park you know where there, there's a substantial uh road works and things there but that's also uh all our recreational facilities and upgrades are going down and all of these works they're put in a line there but they're the things that we have planned in our council plan to deliver uh and they're they're continuing to work on those particular particular items uh i uh, i love it where it comes to uh chief ex, uh, executive expenses and i uh I think uh, it's, it really should be uh, uh, highlighted that we have a very frugal uh, 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 CEO here. But look, Council everything is in here. Time. I, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> it was just unfortunate the timing of aligned with that. But thank you very much, oh, yeah, Councillor. Um, <laughs> Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Oh, yes, thanks, Mayor. Um, so further to Councillor Goff's comments, um, uh, today, February 28, is when the third rates instalment notice goes out. So uh, I'm sure the residents will be thrilled to be receiving it's that. It's due. It's due today, yes. So um, I think we've received 61 million so far as of December 31 of the 116.6 uh, million that we were budgeting to receive. So. We do try and spread it out. We don't say everyone pay up front and then we've got a pile of cash and have lumpiness. Um, in terms of the overs and the unders, it is interesting that with the labour shortages, our employee budget is at 1.56 million underspent. So we were expecting to have spent 29.6 million. We've only spent 28.1 of the 57.9. Uh, the interest is 700k ahead of budget. Uh, we do have the 93 million in cash. So it is very important that we competently manage the, the, uh, the money that we steward. So the average rate we're getting now is 3.4, the maximum 4.5, and it did get up to 170,000 a month in the December half year. 
it is a bit of a worry that development seems to have slowed. So we were we're 1.8 million under budget so far in terms of what we were expected to get from uh, open space contributions, and that's basically a, effectively a 5% tax when people subdivide. Anything from you know 500 apartments to, to two apartments, you pay that tax. Um, so development has slowed in Manningham. That open space reserve started at 13.2 million, so it's it's another good example of our cash, but the cash isn't pouring in as quickly in that area. Other areas on the Aqua Arena contract, we were with 369,000 under budget so far in the first uh, six months of the year. From a balance sheet point of view, and we have stepped up the disclosure with the quarterly uh, balance sheets. So, uh, our net equity is up by 62 million in the half year to a record 2.574 uh, billion. And just in terms of where, where who we trust with our bank, we do tend to have a bit of a thing with interstate banks, I've noticed. So we've got 26.8 million with the Sydney-based Commonwealth Bank, 4.5 million with the Brisbane-based Bank of Queensland, 10 million with the Sydney-based AMP, 3 million with the Sydney-based Westpac, 10 million with the Sydney-based Macquarie. But we do have 17.5 million with National Australia Bank, which is Melbourne. We do have 14 million with Suncor, which is being bought by Melbourne-based ANZ. And most pleasingly, we've got seven and a half million with the Bendigo and Adelaide <coughs> Bank up there in Bendigo. So we do have a plan to reduce this cash with an increased capital uh, program over the 10 years, uh, as we discussed earlier. But as you can tell, uh, councillors, we are in a strong financial position to step up our capital uh, spending. And I'd like to thank the officers and all councillors who served beforehand for this position. And I'll finish on one anecdote. In the city of Maribyrnong, the rates are 0.25% of the value of your house. So if you've got a house at 750,000 in Maribyrnong, you're paying 1,900 rates. In the city of Manningham, the rates are 0.15%. So you've got to have a house worth 1.2 million to pay the to pay the $1,900 in rates. But Maribyrnong then has a 35% differential premium on commercial and a 65% premium on industrial. So they are absolutely flogging their community compared to our low tax time. rates history. So well done for the prudential financial management of all we've been before. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Do I have any speakers against? Do I have any other speakers for? Councillor Kleinert. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just thought it'd be also good to mention that um, last, last page of the report highlights the um, in transparency, uh, the uh, the KPIs for our CEO moving into the the next year, and uh, it's great to see um, that they're all on track, 100%. Have got the green light that they're all on track, and um, this really uh, our KPIs uh, for our CEO link back to our council plan, and it's a plan that we worked together with the community. Uh, it's got the, the wonderful pillars of community, environment, places and spaces, economy and well governed council. So just like to um, take note there for all to see in transparency that um, you know, we put our CEO's KPIs in there and, and um, keep it all on track. And that's why we're, um, it's, a, it's a very good uh, report all, all uh, in all. And um, congratulations to the officers for putting that all together and the work that's done in the background too to make uh, this report um, what it is. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Kleinert. Uh, Councillor Lang. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Kleinert um, started <laughs> what I was going to talk about, but I just want to reassure the public that the Manningham Quarter Report, yes, it's a great read. Yes, there our council plan is progressing well and our CEO's KPIs are also progressing well. And thank you to um, Councillor Stephen Main and Councillor Goff for detailing the details. I just want to bring it to the public's um, you know, forefront that the reason for this Manningham Quarterly Report is because we want to achieve good results with our community and ratepayer money. And we want to do that in a really wise fashion. So I just wanted to bring that to the forefront. And then I'll take the opportunity to uh, let Councillor Goff know that I am also looking forward to the must needed upgrade of the drainage system in, Manning, um, in oh, Melbourne Hill oh. Road catchment, um, protecting the surrounding environment at the same time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carly Lang. Uh, Councillor Anna Chen. 
Well, uh, I'm not going to say uh, to, to comment about anything uh, financial, uh, about money, and about performance, about governance. I just want to say, uh, touch on something interesting. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say that we uh, council recently conducted a survey about what activities uh, the community would like to participate. And uh, in, very interesting that uh, the survey results say that walking is the most popular activity engaged by our residents in our municipality. So that account, uh, accounted to 51%, uh, more than half of the people that that's respond said that we love walking. And also we asked about where you prefer to get active. Not surprisingly, parks is the place that people fall number one, where we like to get active. So this survey is very helpful for our officers to plan for any programs and activities for our communities to participate, to get active, to get healthy. And also it is very important for council in terms of our budget planning, say we should spend more money, for example, on our open spaces because the statistics tell us we should. And we also need to spend more money to improve the the status and the condition of our footpaths because our community said that we love walking. So thank you for all people, all the residents who participate in our survey because it is really important for councillors to make decisions in accordance to the community <coughs> preference. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Do I have any other speakers? So I'm going to put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that is unanimously carried. Thank you, councillors. I will now move on to item 13.2, the National General Assembly 2023 Motions Electric Vehicle Charging Infrastructure. I'd like to move the councillors' alternative motion. Thank you, Councillor Lightbody. Do you want to read out that alternative motion, please? Yep. I've been saving my breath because this is a long one. <laughs> um, I'm going to read out the whole motion because there's a second um, half to this motion that was added later on that will not be in the agenda that's published already. So the motion is that Council endorse the following motions to be submitted to the 2023 ALGA National General Assembly of Local Government, motion one that the National General Assembly requests that the federal government develop an electric charging network program whereby critical infrastructure can be installed nationally efficiently through a single standardized rollout. Two, requests the program provides grant funding and a group of preferred providers to construct and maintain EV <coughs> charging stations for local governments to draw from as they install charges as part of this network. Three, notes that local governments are best placed to understand their communities and regions in identifying these locations. Many have already begun installing this infrastructure as the owners of many public parking locations. However, this can be a place, this can place a significant cost burden on local governments and results in a mishmash of different providers, technologies, payment platforms, and availability of charging stations. Four, notes the anticipated critical labor needs and ensure that there are skills and supplies for timely maintenance and repair of EV charges through the appropriate supply chain and training opportunities. The second motion. This National General Assembly calls on the Australian government to address Australia's world highest gambling losses per capita and the intolerable harm of 25 billion of annual losses inflicted upon Australians, local communities, local and regional health and municipal service providers by one, introducing a new dedicated federal gambling regulator, which includes a mandate to implement and oversee a broad tobacco style ban on gambling advertisement. Two, legislating for the complete removal of cash from Australia's fleet of 200,000 poker machines as a national anti-money laundering measure in light of last year's New South Wales Crime Commission report, revealing widespread money laundering across New South Wales poker machines where criminal money launders, launderers can still load up to up $10,000 in cash into a single poker machine. Three, 
establishing a national ACT style buyback and retirement of poker machine licenses with an initial bu budget allocation of $500 million and make it conditional on the state and territory governments and the participating clubs, pubs, casinos agreeing to permanently retire these licenses and remove the attached machines from their venues. Four, negotiating a moratorium agreement with the Northern Territory government to cease issuing any new low tax digital bookma bookmaking licenses to foreign owned gambling operators, such as Sportsbet, Bet 365, Ladbrokes, Better, and instead transferring online gambling licenses and regulations to a new federal regulator. Five, legislating to the effect that federally registered political parties are ineligible for federal per vote political funding if they or any of their state affiliates own and operate poker machine venues. And six, removing the DGR status of any church or charity, which continues to directly own, operate, license gambling entities such as poker machine clubs. Thank you, Councillor Lightblood. Uh, do I have a second for that alternate motion? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. <coughs> Councillor Lightbody, would you like to speak to the alternate motion? No, I think yes. <laughs> Just because we all love listening to me. Um, <laughs> I'll try and keep it short and I'll only speak to the first motion and I'll let um, Councillor Main speak to the second. The past few years have seen underinvestment by governments in the development and construction of EV charging infrastructure and the underinvestment has led to a sparsity of public charging stations, many of which use several type of, types of plugs and many drivers find charges that are out of order. While EV charging now occurs primarily in public, private households due to the high cost of EV models with becoming more affordable EV vehicles um, reaching our markets in the coming years, there'll be a growing demand for public charging stations, which the current supply is inefficient and inadequate to support. In metropolitan areas, EV owners who live in apartment buildings, units and townhouses that do not have off-street parking or in developments built without electric vehicle charging facilities will drive the demand for more public EV stations, whereas in regional areas, demand will come from local EV owners and a desire for more equitable EV access as a means to support inter-regional travel and tourism and visitors. A national strategy is required to provide consistencies across all regions in Australia. And in 2022, Manningham was part of a consolidated response to the first national electric vehicle strategy consultation coordinated by the Victorian Greenhouse Gas Alliances, which seeks to improve affordability, supply and uptake of EV vehicles, ensuring Australians can access the best transport technologies to help meet their emissions reduction targets. Um, and so this is supplementary to that, asking that there is also the infrastructure built to support our communities in that transition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lightbody. Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Thanks, Mick. I'd first thank Councillor Lightbody for agreeing to move the combined uh, dual motions. Uh, just to go through the six points on the gambling issue. Uh, the first one is to introduce a federal gambling regulator um, and to introduce a tobacco style advertising ban. I think we're all sick of the $300 million of uh, TV ads that are deluging us uh, morning, noon, and night. Only the feds through radio and TV licenses uh, can do this uh, nationally. Uh, point two is uh, legislating for the complete removal of cash. Um, Australians are losing 15 billion a year on poker machines, 3.5 billion in Victoria, 8 billion in New South Wales, which is the world's highest level of spending because it's the worst in Australia, and Australia is the worst in the world. And we've now got Crime Commission reports saying there's massive money laundering going on. Why do you need to load up $10,000 of cash into a machine in New South Wales if you're not a money launderer? So the government says eliminating cash will eliminate crime and reduce losses overall. Our gamblers can set a limit. So let the feds get involved in driving that nationally. Point three, a buyback. We did a guns buyback. You do water buybacks. When you overissue something, you need to buy it back. Best to run it federally. The feds have got the budget. States are too compromised need the tax revenue to get them out, the Fed step in, have a reverse auction, just like they happened in the, in the ACT, and get those 200,000 numbers down. Why does New South Wales have 35% of the world's poker machines in pubs and clubs? It is crazy, just like guns in America. Point four, all those foreign bookmakers are licensed in the Northern Territory, the Bahamas of Australia, 
a tax haven. They pay about 10 million a year in tax to the Northern Territory government and gamblers are losing over 2 billion with them. And they keep issuing licenses like confetti. One closes or gets taken over, another three get issued. They've issued 30 licenses at the moment. Get a moratorium, get the Bahamas out, federal takeover of, of, of licensing, and just get these cowboys in the Northern Territory out of this space, ruining our kids' lives with all these TV ads that they're licensing and not taxing. Point five, the Labor Party owns $120 million worth of pokies clubs, the Ramwick Labor Club and the Canberra Labor Club, only political party in the world who own poker machines. You think we've got a problem? Well, when the political parties and the churches are into the game, it's pretty hard. They're not running tobacco, they're not running guns, why are they running poker machines? So stop giving them federal funding unless they get out of poker machines. It's a massive conflict of interest, regulating an industry that you're profiting from. Gamblers lost 40 million last year on Labor Party owned poker machines in Canberra and Sydney. It's unbelievable. And point six is just a similar approach to the DGR status for charities and churches that choose to, to operate predatory products, which cause hundreds of suicides and do enormous damage, bankrupt a lot of businesses. And uh, so it's strong. It may not get up, it's an omnibus, but it'll trigger an interesting debate, it'll open up some discussions. And um, I think we're getting on the front foot at a time when we need to get on the front foot, given there's this massive damage and harm, and we don't want to have a world record on per capita gambling losses. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Do I have any speakers against? <coughs> Do I have any speakers for, other speakers for, I should say? Can, I, can I just say, uh, I've got actually a actual question for this. Uh, it's just that, uh, yeah, my question, my question, my question is, is this, is this, see, with the federal system, all of the, all of the uh, responsibility for, for these particular areas are vested with states. It's not, it's not, it's not under the jurisdiction of federal. So you're looking at establishing a new body federally to have effect on 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 a state's uh, state thing here, we, why not continue on to the abandonment of state government altogether, and just have uh, things run by the federal government? So um, to answer that question, look, it is a hybrid situation. So ACMA, the federal TV regulator, controls advertising on radio and television, which is in the budget. Oztrack, the National Anti-Money Laundering Group, uh, which is fined Tabcor 100 million, uh, etc. They are a federal body and they're involved in money laundering. So, uh, and the, the it's the Federal Labor Party that controls the Canberra Labor Club. They can't dispose without a national conference resolution. So, I do think, and the DGR status is using the federal taxing power and tax deducting power to send an incentive for a community good. So, yes. It's the states that issue the licences that do all the damage, and this is looking to a whole range of federal levers that can intervene where the states have been totally compromised and failed. Councillor Goff, did you want to speak to the motion? No, 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 I just wanted to... Any other speakers for? <coughs> so I'll put that to a vote, the alternate motion. All those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 14, Chief Executive Officer. 14.1, appointment of authorised officer, Planning and Environment Act 1987. Do I have a mover? Councillor Clonet. Let the recommendation be adopted. And do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Andrew Conlon. Councillor Clonet, would you like to speak to the motion? <coughs> Councillor Conlon, any speakers against? All those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you. 14.2, informal meetings of councillors. Do I have a mover? Councillor Laura May. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, do I have a seconder? I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Laura May, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? Thank you, again, carried unanimously. Item number 15, notices of motion. 15.1, notice of motion by Councillor Stephen Main. Do I have a mover for this? Mayor, surprisingly, I move that the motion be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. And do I have a seconder? 
I'll second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Carly Lane. Councillor Stephen Mayne, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. So uh, this motion was uh, triggered, I think, after a very informative briefing we had with the North East Link Authority and, and some of the major contractors, uh, where it was very detailed, lots of interesting information, and it just struck me that we don't, haven't actually had a formal report to this council giving an update on the North East Link project and its very many uh, impacts. Um, so the motion is quite broad in simply requesting the officers to provide an update report to council before the end of the year. So there's no time pressure before the end of the calendar year. Um, the, the only specific request we're making is uh, to get an update on the relocation program for all those displaced businesses in the Bullion Industrial Precinct. I thought it was particularly good news to hear from the North East Link at that briefing that more than 80 of the 90 odd affected businesses have successfully relocated. So the, the closures have been much less than was originally feared or anticipated. So a report on what information we can get, and I appreciate there may be some commercial sensitivities, but some information we can get on just how that reloc relocation program has gone, I think would be helpful for the community and all those businesses to see um, who's gone where and, and what's happened. And then it's just asked for a brief summary of, of council's input into the project so far. And obviously we had the Supreme Court litigation in the previous council. It's been far more um, uh, cooperative since then. And also just spelling out any milestones where we may do a submission um, into any formal planning processes over the balance of this term. And then it just invites the officers to include any other information they regard as pertinent to council and wider Manningham. So I don't want to generate too much work for the officers with this. We're not looking for war and peace. But I think a, a, a succinct update informing the community, informing councillors, laying out the path ahead and I think ventilating what is, I mean, that's a good news story when 90 businesses have been dis displaced, but a, a, a less bad outcome it seems in terms of, of uh, all those uh, acquisitions and relocations of that large industrial precinct in Bulleen. So I uh, uh, hope the officers are okay with, uh, with working something out for us. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Councillor Carly Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, very briefly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Stephen Main, for um, wording the motion and also for explaining it. I just wanted to um, reiterate that this is a advocacy and information piece, and it is really important um, for the community to uh, know what um, what has happened and to advocate for the milestones that have happened and also um, that the, um, the steps that will happen in the future. And our community um, like to be informed and it's really important to have this piece to be. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carly Lang. Do I have any speakers against? Do I have any other speakers for? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? Thank you, that's carried unanimously. Councillors, I would like to take you back to item 14, Chief Executive Officer, because thanks to Councillor Goff, we did note that we neglected to discuss item 14.3, documents for sealing. So I would like to ask, do we have a mover for that? Yes, you do. And Thank I have, you, I Councillor I haven't Goss. done this for years. I think this is really uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I move that the following documents be signed and sealed. Consent to build over an easement agreement under section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, Council and SNB Wong and CWK Chan, 65 The Boulevard, Doncaster, and also a second one, which is consent to build over an easement agreement under 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, Council and 118 Beverly Proprietary Limited, 118 Beverly Street, Doncaster East. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Kleiner. Councillor Goff, would you like to speak to the motion? No. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Clarnett. Any speakers against? 
thought your hand was up, Councillor Conlon. Um, all those in, I'll put it to a vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. I will now move back, councillors, to item number 16, urgent business. And there are no items of urgent business. Item 17, councillor reports and question time. Councillors, does anyone wish to provide a report or raise a question? Councillor Anna Chen. Uh, yes, Mayor. I would like to thank our resident of Doncaster East, Andrew Milligan, who had again transformed <coughs> his family home at Push King Court into a massive Christmas lights display last year. Andrew has brought joy to the community for the past 17 years. It took up to six weeks to put all those displays on with the help of his neighbours. Uh, the 2022 Christmas displays uh, lights display also raised funds for the state emergency service management unit. And uh, incidentally, the unit recently celebrating its 66 years of serving our community. Let me just list it, uh, a list of the things they, 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 they do for our community. Motor vehicle and aircraft accidents, fire, flood, storm and research and rescue operations. I understand that the money, quite a lot of money raised for SES management, and I understand that the money raised will go towards keep the uh, volunteers trained and in safety equipment and uniforms. Mayor, I wish to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge and thank the good deeds and generosity of the Milligan's family the community, and of course, the dedication of our volunteers who serve at the SES management unit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen, and I'd like to echo that. Thank you to the resident for being so generous in putting on that light show, and also to thank the Manningham SES for their support over the last 60 years. Do I have any other councils that would like to make a report? Councillor Carly Lang. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to um, congratulate all the volunteers who run the Warrandyte Pottery Expo um, every year. This is an international event, councillors, and it does take a lot of um, local community effort. It does um, bring um, sustainable tourism into Manningham and brings visitors statewide to Manningham. We should be very proud of the talented artists that um, display their work and their passion, skill and creativity. And it is something to be very proud of. And I thank all of the artists at the expo. I thank all the visitors and especially the volunteers who put on this event from Manningham. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Carly Lang. Any other reports? Councillor Laura Main. Thank you. Um, I'd like to congratulate the Doncaster Junior Football Club on their recent multicultural footy for fun program, which was partially funded by a community grant and went over four weeks. Um, the Mayor and I actually had the chance of going down last Friday and it looked like lots of fun. Um, it's really encouraging to see the effort that's been put into including the multicultural community in footy, which I guess ha doesn't have a history of always being the most inclusive um, and really acknowledging the realities of the demographics of our local community. Um, the marketing included translating the, translating the program into, I think it was 40 plus languages and putting that across social media, visiting lots of the local schools repetitively, um, and I guess just reaching out to sectors of our community, which could be a little bit untouched or maybe even disconnected. Um, so I'd just like to congr congratulate them on a great program and also good luck to the season ahead. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Any other speakers, Councillors? Councillor Stephen Main. Uh, yes, Mayor. So last <laughs> Wednesday, uh, along with uh, Council Officer Felicity Raper, Felicity Rapier, we attended the Victorian Local Government Working Group on Gambling. Uh, which was an interesting 90-minute uh, meeting, and I was particularly struck by the presentation by Lindsay Shaw from the Re Victorian Responsible Gaming Foundation, who reported that uh, calendar 2022 poker machine losses in Victoria's 500 pubs and clubs were 3.05 billion, which was up 12% on the previous record. Um, the worst hit areas were the poorest areas, so councils like Brimbank, Hume, Whittlesea, um, all had losses exceeding 25% 25, 25 growth 
in their losses. So exponential growth in their losses in the poorest areas. Back when I used to work in the anti-gambling space, there was only one venue in Victoria pub that had losses of more than 20 million. Now there's 14. So anyone who says, oh, it's all moving online, it's all sports, but these are the issues, uh, no. 15 billion on pokies nationally, 3.5 billion in Victoria, including the circa 450 million at Crown on top of the, the pubs and clubs. There was a good presentation from Monash, which has produced a very strong new policy, uh, banning all messaging from pokies clubs on all their sporting fields, not allowing people to receive grants. It's just a very, very Darabin style hard line. And dozens and dozens of councils are reviewing their gambling policy at the moment, as we are. So we've got uh, a lot of people working in the space. Um, I should also briefly say I did apply for a new job last uh, Friday. I ran for the Board of Aristocrat Leisure, the world's biggest uh, poker machine manufacturer. Uh, the $24 billion company, some of the incumbent directors were quite popular. They got re-elected with 99%. Unfortunately, I fell a tad short and I received 0.33% uh, of the vote, worth $58 million dollars worth of shares against about 15 billion against. So unfortunately I won't be moving to Sydney to join the Aeroscrap board and you're stuck with me here at council. Thank you, councillor. Their loss is our gain. Any other speakers? Councillor Conlon. Yeah, I'd just like to report to my fellow councillors regarding uh, this recreation and sports advisory committee kickoff. As I mentioned before, uh, it was a great night. Thank you, Councillor Lang, Councillor Main. Um, we, it's incredible the depth of talent that our community has volunteered to put their hand up with, and um, we look forward to making sure that the community is heard in the, the way we make our uh, recreation facilities accessible to the public. And and the way we care for them. So, all those been uh, all those people were keen as mustard, and um, I think it'll be a great and successful committee. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Any other speakers, councillors? Thank you. So I will move to item number eighteen, please. Confidential reports. Do I have a mover? Councillor Carly Lang. I move that council close the meeting to the public pursuit under section 661 and 662A of the Local Government Act 2020 to consider the following items. Item 18.1, age care reform. Item 18.2, community tra transport for future directions. Item 18.3, facility management and leisure services tender and item 18.4, property matter. Thank you, Councillor Kali Lang. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Klein, at all those in favour? Carried unanimously. We will be now closing this meeting to the members of the public and end our live stream to consider these confidential items. Thank you very much for joining the meeting.